Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Instant Camera Guy, where we will be taking my client's SX70 Sona and performing quite a few upgrades to it. So this camera belongs to a client of mine named Jeremy, who is from the USA. Uh, Jeremy has used my services before, uh, having sent in his Polaroid SLR 680 Special Edition for some upgrades. I swapped out the housing with a clear colored unit, uh, and recently he sent the camera back to me for a modification to PC flash sync. So this actually means he'll be able to hook up a studio strobe, which will fire alongside the standard built-in flash, uh, just allowing you to do lots of other creative stuff, um, which is really, really cool. So uh, Jeremy and I had a chat about that. Um, he was actually one of the first people to ask me whether or not such a mod was possible and uh, I went to the drawing board and came back with a solution and totally works which is really really cool so uh, while I was there I also upgraded his motor um, because his original one had started to become a little bit tired and didn't always autofocus now that issue is corrected but uh, in addition to this camera I will be sending back of course his Chrome SX70 which we're gonna give a whole bunch of upgrades to so we will be adding an SX70 RPCB for manual control of the shutter. We will be adding another clear shutter housing, uh, replacing the rather tired looking black model. Uh, we will also be replacing the green shutter button. Uh, well, replacing the red shutter button with this lovely green example. And the last thing is fitting the camera with a brand new bottom panel made by Polar Studio, which is USB-C chargeable, has a built-in lithium ion battery, and will convert the camera to be able to take iType film. Now I'll probably talk a little bit about this uh, battery adapter in just a short while. Um, but yeah, by the time we end up adding all of these things, this is going to be one sweet unit. Um, I-type film, full manual control, the ability to plug in a flash if you want to, the ability to plug in a dedicated dongle for uh, flash sync, all that kind of stuff is going to be really, really cool stuff. So I can't wait to dive in. Um, Jeremy's camera is a slightly later model SX70 sonar, and I could tell straight away just from how the glue smelled when I was de-skinning it. Uh, he sent it to me with the skin on. The skin was in pretty rough condition, but when I was heating it up, I went, oh, this is actually a late model. And sure enough, checking the serial number, it was 1981, so right before uh, they swapped to making the SLR 680, and it uses the same adhesive as you find on the SLR 680, uh, which still has a little bit of its sticky residue still on the body of the camera. Um, but yeah, very interesting stuff. I knew straight away from when I heated it up, it's got this kind of, I don't even know how you describe it. It's this weird chemically smell. It's probably not great to inhale, but um, yeah. Very interesting model because it's sort of right at the end uh, when they were phasing out the SX70 in favor of the SLR 680. I have tested this camera very briefly. Overall, it's in very clean condition, other than the insides are very, very dusty. Uh, the autofocus works completely fine. The shutter also works completely fine. And one of the other things that I'm going to do, in addition to this camera, uh, Jeremy sent along a SX70 Model 1, which was in super rough condition, absolutely beat up. And I managed to salvage the chassis from it. Um, we always knew that the camera was not going to be refurbished, but I did salvage the chassis, and in particular, I will be reusing the Fresnel screen from this. Reason being is that the Model 1 had the split prism, and the sonar and all autofocus models never came out with that. So I'll be swapping these mirrors over once we're inside the camera. So I'll walk through that in just a second. But um, yeah, I think we should start just by tearing this thing apart. Um, now I was asked in my last video that I did because I'm doing a series at the moment, as of the time of me recording this, I'm doing a few videos on 
Polaroid's current range of i-type cameras. So, uh, you know, things like the One Step, One, uh, one Step Plus, One Step 2, the Now, the Go, the i2, uh, things like the Impossible Project Instant Lab, the Impossible i1. I've been doing a few videos on the subject of lithium ion batteries, particularly how in those cameras, the lithium ion battery that's built in is not easy for the user to replace. Um, they generally require complete disassembly of the camera, uh, often the use of a soldering iron to solder in the new battery. And, oh, this is interesting. Hold that thought. I don't think I've ever seen an SX-70 sonar with an all black chassis before. That is really cool. Um, usually these are like a metallic color. I've never seen one that's this color before. It's like it's been painted. This must have been like a 1981 thing that they did. Because uh, I did message Jeremy, I said, look, this is a fairly unusual version of the SX-70 Sonar. So anyway, not that it does anything and not that you'll ever see this black chassis, but it's kind of cool to know about. But that's, that's really cool. You know, I've been doing this for such a long period of time, 13 years or so, I believe I've been repairing instant cameras. And I still see, I still see after taking apart and repairing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cameras per year, I still see things that I've never seen, <laughs> which is really cool. Now, where was I? Oh, sorry. I was talking about the built-in rechargeable lithium ion batteries and how non-user replaceable they are being that you need to dismantle the camera, being that you often need to use a soldering iron, and someone asked me if I had an opinion on the Polar Studios battery back, which I just showed off here. Now, in terms of this back, inside in the rear housing, so basically what they've done is made an exact reproduction of the original Polaroid bottom panel. They've just lengthened it about five millimeters, so the camera is ever so slightly longer, but it is otherwise an identical copy. And sitting in the back sits charging circuitry and a lithium ion battery, and it actually sends uh, through the panels onto these two, um, two little uh, brass terminals at the base, and that is what connects to the original terminals and will ultimately power the camera. Now, my opinion on the Polar Studios battery adapter backs um, is that they are amazing in terms of aesthetics. Simply put, I don't personally believe that there is another battery adapter on the market that looks as good as this one does. I mean, just look how well it matches the original Chrome. It is so spot on. This would have taken, like, I don't want to, I don't want to imagine how much research and development had to go into choosing a chrome finish that matched the Alpha Spec chrome. So from an aesthetic point of view, from a product point of view, this thing is really as good as it gets. I mean, the finish, the quality of materials, everything about it, just absolutely awesome. Um, they are very expensive. I think they're at least two to three hundred US dollars. I, I actually have no idea off the top of my head, but please feel free to Google it and, and check out in your own currency. They aren't cheap is what I'm trying to say. Like they're at least double the price of what Retrospect charge for their AAA adapter. Um, but they do look really awesome. However, I'm going to mark down this battery adapter pretty severely because it starts to introduce the same problem as all the current i-type cameras on the market. In that, how the hell am I supposed to change the battery? Once I install this thing, I've got to fix it in place with four screws, which is not so bad, right? Four screws is pretty easy, and then there's several screws, all Phillips head, they're, 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 nothing spec they're nothing strange, all Phillips head screws that remove that access panel, and that gives you access to the battery inside. But if I put leather skin on that bottom cam on that bottom panel, and I'm going to give Jeremy the option of this, because he has, he has sent me some leather in which to reskin this. He actually had it cut and made himself. Um, but if I skin that in about... Oh, anywhere from two to five years time, depending on how much you use the camera. We're gonna need a D-skin 
and dismantle the thing to access that battery. So Johnny, I love your products, but for the love of all that is holy, can you please figure out a way to introduce like a little trap door here? Like a little panel, there's so much room to put one. A little panel with a little screwdriver or something so that we can just dangle and drop the battery out and just have like the corresponding JST connector so that we can plug a new pouch cell in. Um, that's all I ask because the fact that that isn't there is so frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after spending so much money on this thing. But anyway, I digress. It's just a problem that really, really irritates me. Um, because getting inside to repair an SX70, at the absolute minimum, you need to take off that bottom panel of leather. And uh, yeah, having to do so every few years to replace your lithium ion battery, super frustrating. So yeah, before I reskin this thing, I will be giving my client Jeremy the option. I'll say, look, do you want me to put the bottom leather panel on? Or do you want me to just leave it? Because it's a, it's a pretty nice finish. I mean, they've even got the, the logo there for Polar Studios embossed in the bottom panel. So, uh, but yeah, it, it's like they were so close to having the perfect solution. Um, you know, you don't even need to put the panel on the back. You could put it at the bottom where you're really never going to see it. Like that just has to have the slightest cutout and like two screw holes either side. So you could just have like a little rectangular panel and just take out two Phillips head screws. Boop, pop it off, swing the battery out, plug in the new one. You know what I mean? Like it, it was so close to being perfect. So would I recommend you buy one? No, I actually wouldn't. Um, I do think, honestly, they are the, the best on the market in terms of quality of materials and how they look. But I, would, I just wouldn't recommend one. I, I wouldn't own one. That would frustrate me. Like, that would, that would give me OCD paranoia uh, about owning the camera, knowing that inevitably it's going to die. Um, and look, part of that is a me problem, I guess. It, it comes from the byproduct of being a repairman. I spend all day long fixing these things for other people so that they work, you know, for someone's lifetime. The last thing I want to be doing is fixing my own damn cameras. And so as a result, everything that I own personally is like easy to service. I'm just, I'm not interested in owning something that's going to be a faff if I have to fix it. So, that's just a little slice of personal philosophy from me, if you've ever wondered my thoughts. Um, and that, that basically applies to all the cameras that I own. Um, that applies to things like uh, my medium format cameras, my 35mm. I, I want everything to be fairly easy to source parts for, um, you know, if, if and when they ever fail. And I want the repairs to all be things that I can do. Um, and actually on one of my cameras, I'll just show you something. Hold it there. On my uh, open SX-70, which I will do a video about this in the future, but I even put, because you only really need two screws to hold the bottom panel on because of this lip shape. I actually put two screw holes in the leather of mine so that I can hold it in place just using two Torx head screws and remove that bottom panel any time that I want because this was a camera that I was constantly upgrading and uh, stuffing around with so I did that to give myself some access. Just a little aside. And of course Johnny from Polar Studio could offer the same. I mean he could give people a little tool to, to die cut leather panels so that you could skin it die cut it from the other side to give access to the screw holes. I don't know, there's lots of different solutions. I would just like to see it have a battery door. Because a little door panel is not that aesthetically unpleasing. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can make it out of the same color material. It doesn't have to look ugly. Just do it. Anyway, certainly we have a... Um, <laughs> a later model sonar because it uses the same crumbly rubber brushing, uh, rubber br brush? Bushing. Rubber bushing material um, as the SLR 680 uses. So that's crumbled into dust, which is just nice. 
Um, it's making a mess here. I've just got the little head of a toothbrush. I'm just gonna <laughs> just get this uh, petrified rubber off the casing of the motor. And I'm just gonna also, look at all the debris it's left. I'm just gonna do that over my bin. I've got a little trash can down here. There we go. Um, so messy, so dirty. But I, honestly, I think that's probably the only, fingers crossed, that'll be the only um, misbehaving that I see from this particular camera, hopefully. Uh, I will open up the motor before I go into the Fresnel screen. There we go. Cool. Just put the little piles of washers to the side. Uh, now this motor was in very healthy sounding shape when I pulled it out of the camera. Uh, as you guys could probably hear from my little test of it before. But I'm still going to recondition the motor anyway, just to be on the safe side. After all, Jeremy has sent his camera to me halfway across the world after all, so I want to be sure I do a damn good job. So that he never needs to send it back. Unless something catastrophic happens for it, to it, uh, and he wants further upgrades. Because yeah, it is, it is certainly not my intention to have clients uh, having to send me stuff more than once. That's just not what I'm all about. So I will recondition this anyway to make sure it's nice. Uh, but I am keen to see how that battery adapter performs. I haven't actually read the instruction manual on it, but I think I figured out how to sort of turn it on and off. Um, it even has like a built-in LED for the film counter to illuminate it at night. Like it's, they really have thought of everything except a battery door, which just irritates me. Can you guys tell I'm angry about it? <laughs> Like, I just, uh, be better, damn it. Make better things to all you designers watching. Because there's no excuse for it. Like, it was literally the industry standard, like, a decade ago. It's only recently that we've somehow been tricked by big businesses into accepting otherwise. Dear, oh dear, my phone is absolutely going off in my pocket. Let me just see if I'm copying messages. No, just texts. Just clients telling me that um, stuff is on the way to be repaired, which is great. Um, I cannot believe how busy I am. Um, this is sort of like the first time that I'm actually doing repair as a full-time gig. It is no longer a part-time hobby business anymore. I am officially in the deep end, managing myself. And the, something that stopped me doing this earlier is I just, I didn't think that there was gonna be enough demand for it. And holy moly, was I wrong. <laughs> like, there is so much demand for it. I mean, just look at this little channel. I've only had it open just over a month. I've already got 500 subscribers. I've got a dedicated bunch of followers that like to leave comments on every single video. Uh, and that reminds me, actually, I definitely need to give a shout out to my follower, Andrew, I believe it was. Let me just check the computer. I'm sure it's Andrew, um, who made a donation uh, via my coffee account just to help support what it is that I do. Uh, yep, definitely, I got that right. Andrew Walbridge is his name. So thank you for the shout out. Uh, and thank you for the donation. I will buy myself some lunch with your with your kind donation there. Um, yeah, he sent that to me after my um, uh, little little. I guess you could call it a documentary of sorts on the uh, SX70 Model Three, um, which I I uploaded just the other day. And if you guys haven't seen that video, I basically do a teardown of one of the strangest SX-70 models ever to be released, which is the, the Model 3. So basically, it's, if you've never seen one, it's, a, it's an SX-70 camera that isn't an SLR. 
Um, and like you have to question like why was such a thing made and well if you've ever wondered that very question well I would highly recommend giving that video a watch because I go into details in terms of why it exists in the first place and uh, the answer might surprise you so if you haven't seen that one definitely look it up uh, you'll find it in my video feed I uploaded it just the other day and uh, yeah got heaps of comments on that video actually so hopefully that continues to gain traction um, and on the subject of videos, if you guys want me to cover certain topics, or you want to hear my opinion on things, if you want me to do a review, if you want me to just talk about my personal cameras, like, whatever it is that you guys want, it's pretty easy for me to make these videos. Um, I specifically have sort of chosen... <laughs> actually, I had someone email me before, and I guess because I'm Australian, they were like, do you watch Dank Pods? Um, who's a, I mean, you probably know Dank Pods. If you're watching me, you probably know who Dank Pods is. Um, but he's a, a YouTuber. He's got a few channels. He's got Garbage Time and The Drum Thing. Um, what he basically does is very similar setup to me. He's got an overhead camera. Uh, and he, sorry, I'm just trying to get this stupid spring in. It's always much harder on the Sonar models. He's got an overhead camera and it's just his hands and a green iPad and that is like his entire background. And he just talks about random audio stuff uh, like headphones and iPods and, and that kind of stuff. It's not all iPod content, he does a lot of different stuff. Um, and, and I was asked like, is Dank Pods a big inspiration? And he did a video at the end of last year basically just describing his workflow. Like he, he did a sort of review on the new iPhone, the iPhone 14 or whatever it was. And in that review video, he gave us a bit of a background in terms of his workflow that he pretty much records and edits like very simple cuts of, of um, his content so that he can basically just crank out videos very quickly in a day. And I'm basically doing the same thing here. Um, so certainly Dank Pods was an inspiration in terms of like, do you know what? These videos don't have to be crazy. Like it can literally just be me um, doing repair, providing commentary, um, which I must say is something that I'm just, I'm naturally good at. I'm not, I'm actually not very much of like a, I guess an extroverted person, but if you get me talking about something that I'm passionate about or that I know a lot on, um, I can happily talk, like, for hours. <laughs> Even in public. Like, I, I don't mind public speaking at all. As long as I know what I'm talking about, like, if I, if I know, like, hey, I actually know quite a bit about that subject, I can natter on for hours and just provide ad-libbed commentary. But, um, actually, my far bigger inspiration, um, is not Dank Pods at all, actually. It's Adrian's Digital Basement, which, um... I cannot tell you the amount of stuff I've learnt off his channel over the years. Um, his name is Adrian Black. Uh, I think he's in Portland, so he's an American guy. Um, he repairs old computers, like old Commodore 64s and um, Amigas and that kind of stuff. And his videos are very similar to mine in that it's v they're very long form. Um, like most of his videos are at a minimum 45 minutes. Many of them even longer, like easily can clock over like an hour and 20. Um, and really all he does is this, like he just sits there and chats about what he's doing and his, his work process, his thought process behind his refurbishments. And uh, yeah, he was such an inspiration in terms of me making this I guess, channel. Like, I've been live streaming ever since COVID. Um, and I'm not sure if I was watching Adrian very much back then. Maybe I, maybe I had, maybe I hadn't. I really can't remember, it's such a blur. But oh, these hinge pins are gonna be hard to get out, aren't they? Come on, jeez. I thought this camera was gonna be well behaved. Um, let's see, how can I wiggle them out? because I've got to remove this for now. And sometimes the plastic here can be very brittle. So I think, I think I'm just gonna use a bit of 
penetrating oil. Because when in doubt, just use a bit of lube. Lube makes the world go round, you know? It is actually one of the most single important industries in the world. Lubricants, do you know that? Because without lube, literally no machinery exists. <laughs> you just can't have industrialized machinery without it. So basically everything that exists doesn't exist without lube. So remember to use lube, guys. That's what I'm saying. Um, but no, seriously, I do want to take these hinge pins out and they are really stuck. And because they're so stuck, I'm now concentrating on this instead of talking about how much I love Adrian Black and his content. Come on. Oh, geez, Louise. Okay. Um, I'm going to hold it there. I'm going to pause because I'm going to need to do this off camera because this requires intense concentration. And this might take me like 15 minutes to get these damn hinge pins out. So I'm going to be right back. All right, we are back. Um, for those wondering the way I managed to get those hinge pins out, I actually got some old hinge pins from a different camera, inserted them from the outside, hammered them down to push the hinge pins further in. So basically the wrong way, but that broke the seal. And then I could push them back out and then out further with the spike. Now I'm just using some side cutters so I can get a grip on the last pin. Yeah, those were really held in there, like really tightly. I'm just gonna undo the springs at the rear and then we can lift this Fresnel screen out. Um, being that this is a sonar model um, and being that we are swapping the Fresnel screen, I'm actually just gonna remove it and put it over to the side um, whilst I clean the mirror and the bellows. And given that this was produced during the 680, um, the 680 sort of era, I'm actually gonna have to check that mirror silicon now that I say all this out loud. Oh, yep, there you go. Bop, bow. Well, there you go, guys. If your SX-70 sonar, I'm trying to figure out when Polaroid made the swap from silicon that actually worked to silicon that doesn't. <laughs> And I think it was around 1980, certainly 1981 from February. Uh, yeah, you're gonna need your camera serviced. So let that be a lesson that unless your sonar was produced in the earlier days of production, it's gonna use the same crappy mirrors that the SLR 680 used. So there you go. I will see what kind of updates I can find, like the more information I get the more I want to let people know about this kind of stuff but this is why it is just so important to get your cameras refurbished properly if you're going to use them because I see so many people that are like oh yeah it works really well like you know I bought it from marketplace or I got it from craigslist or gumtree or something like that um, and it just totally works yeah for how long that would have worked before the mirror dropped no one can know and if it drops and it smashes, you're in for a very bad time. But you guys already know that if you watch this channel, I don't need to tell you that a million times. But this is why it's just so important because that was a disaster waiting to happen. Um, anyway, well, that's exciting. That definitely means that this is gonna be like a two day video because I've got to wait for uh, mirror silicon to dry. So I'm certainly not gonna do any more stuff to the body of this camera other than clean it and give the gear train a bit of a lube um, because it's gonna need to sit off to the side. Um, anyway, yeah, on to why I started to make these videos. So I've, I've been refurbishing Polaroid cameras for a hell of a long, a hell of a long period of time. Um, I think about 13 years unofficially at the time of me releasing this video. Um, probably 12 or 11 years officially as of being like a registered business here in Australia that pays tax and yada yada yada. Um, always running it like as a hobby, like not as a primary source of income, but just running it 
on the side as a bit of a hobby, as a bit of a tax deduction, you know, get my film tax deducted and all that kind of stuff. Um, but certainly as of this year, it's, it's looking like all my hard work over the last decade or so and all of my experience, I can certainly more than do this full time uh, and pay the bills. Um, but yeah, the inspiration for my videos came, I mean, where I was living at the time, Melbourne, when COVID hit and we had the lockdowns, we were the most locked down state in Australia and one of the most locked down places in the world. So there was not a lot to do otherwise. And so I was talking to my wife and one of the things I, I sort of figured, I was like, you know, in Chinatown, sometimes they have those little windows at the front of the Chinese restaurants and you can see people make dumplings. If you've never seen a restaurant like that, um, they're quite fun to watch because dumpling making, like clearly the ladies that are there that are usually at the front, they've made like a million dumplings over the course of their life and they make it look just so easy. They're like a little machine, you know, like they've just got so much dumpling making experience. And I said, why don't I do that like live like on Facebook or something like that. And people can just tune in if they want to. And I did, and I kept it going um, because it was nice having like a virtual sort of friend group, people to talk to. Um, and it just kept going and going and going and going. And I thought about doing YouTube, but the truth of the matter is I, I had another job already. And I, I just didn't want to get super busy. Like, I couldn't afford, like, I just didn't want to have to work two jobs sort of doing it full time if I, if my channel took off and I got too busy. But now that I've moved states, I no longer have my old job. I've actually been able to focus on this full time and I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm just at home in the comfort of the air conditioning. No one else telling me what to do, being my own boss. Hashtag love and life. Uh, but no, seriously, it's been really good. And everyone that's shown me support during these videos, uh, during the rise of my channel, anyone that sent me a camera over the years, I couldn't have been here today if it wasn't for you guys. Um, so thank you for all of that, especially if you've given me a donation. Um, anyway, but yeah, so, as I said, Adrian Black, huge inspiration of mine. Um, I could honestly listen to him chat about old computing gear for hours and hours and hours. And I do. Um, and I think, I think as well, like it could just be a very millennial thing. I think that for every short form video that gets released, like YouTube shorts and that kind of stuff, like you guys will notice on this channel, Kind of my, my shortest videos are like, you know, maybe eight minutes long. <laughs> um, and that's because I, I don't believe, I personally don't believe that short form videos are very healthy. I think humans as a species are developing shorter and shorter attention spans. And I don't think that's a good thing. Um, you know, the fact that we've got kids these days growing up with iPads with constant little 15 second video clips endless entertainment because you don't really remember anything from those clips like you can watch you can watch a thousand small little clips in a row and if after an hour i was like oh what do you remember from those you'll struggle you will struggle to think of what you were just watching and i think a lot of the channels that i enjoy in particular are sort of like this reaction to short form content um, that it's become this case of like, like I'm so against, <laughs> I'm so against like watching this mindless drivel that gets cranked out on TikTok and that kind of stuff. And YouTube shorts is just as bad for it. Um, that I'm like, no, if it's, if I'm not learning something and it's not like half an hour long, like I'm not really interested in it. You know what I mean? Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm the weird one, but as a result, that's why I'm producing this kind of content because it's the kind of content I enjoy. Like this is, this is like literally, like if, if you want an insight into my life and what I do in my spare time, I'm watching content similar to what I'm doing. I'm watching in-depth analysis, just 
giving those battery terminals a sand because, well, why not? Jeremy may want to run this thing off of uh, internal batteries one day. But yeah, he, he will mainly be using uh, I-Type, I guess. Still, might as well. Just clean the inside for him. And yeah, that we can basically box this up. Um, there's not really much more I'm gonna do to this until I glue that mirror in, which is sitting over here. So I guess I'll clean that up. Uh, and then, I don't know, we'll come and do the shutter, I guess. Remove the PCB from it and upgrade it. But I certainly can't finish this today unless this mirror gets glued in, so... I'ma just do that now. Now I'm giving the rear of the mirror a clean with some alcohol. These mirrors that came out in 680s and stuff are always quite hazy. I've never been able to sort of ascertain whether or not it's the fact that the silicon, like, because they, they clearly did change silicon to a clear kind of silicon, but I don't know if it's the silicon so much that doesn't stick as it is that, like, there, there's this sort of protective film, and you can kind of see the words. Like, if you, if you get a 680 or a late model sonar like this and you pull off the mirror, the remnants of text you can see on them because these mirrors had like a protective film over them in the factory that said please remove before gluing. And I don't know if there was a machine that did this or it was done by hand, but I don't know if, if it's just the silicon is no good or if that film left like a greasy layer or something like that, which the silicon has a hard time sticking to. I truthfully have no idea. I'd need to like travel back in time and suss it out at the factory figure out what they were using and then do like comparative strength tests of the two silicons in order to figure that out. Um, but regardless, one thing is for sure, when they started to change to this sort of clear silicon, which happened sometime around the 80s, things went downhill and the mirrors started becoming very loose, certainly by now. So again, just a reminder, if you're shooting an unrefurbished camera, it is a ticking time bomb. <laughs> Please get it serviced before it breaks. And also you'll just get better results if you have a serviced camera, like you'll get more accurate exposures, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, uh, so yeah, I'm just gonna literally just glue this down. And I'm gonna have to put this in the cupboard to dry. Maybe I should just do a live stream of the silicon drying, hey? <laughs> See how many views it gets. Watching silicon dry, I don't know. That sounds like something that could accidentally go viral. All right, I am going to put this in the cupboard. And uh, maybe I'll perform a little cut here because my workbench is filling up with tools. Uh, this body panel I will no longer need. Uh, that is an interesting tape on the side of the inside of that panel. Again, this must be like a late 80s thing. Usually this tape is black colored here, it's like green. Certainly something funky happened in the factory with this, with this particular camera. Uh, this viewfinder is really clean. I'm gonna clean it a little later. I can't be bothered doing it now. So yeah, I'm just gonna do a little cut here and uh, come back and I guess we'll work on, uh, work on the shutter. All right, let's rip into this thing, shall we? First thing I'm gonna do is completely get rid of the sonar housing uh, since we will not need it. So I'm gonna put that off to the side because we've got a new one going in. Now, one of the things you have to do on some sonar cameras, just depends on the model, when you take the housing off, uh, there are screws that hold the flash socket to the housing. These screws are completely unnecessary and Polaroid would often just delete these screws from certain cameras. So some sonars don't even have these. Um, I would have assumed that these later models, they would have got rid of those uh, 
sonar screws but anyway it doesn't matter because once the housing's on it actually holds that socket in place the screws are just like extra protection and the new uh the new um housing won't use them so we will get rid of those uh, I'll also get rid of the front housing as well. The front housing we'll need to modify. We'll need to swap out the button to that lovely green one. Um, all of these custom parts, by the way, if you want me to install stuff like this to your camera, please feel free to buy it. Um, I obviously don't have like the capability to do injection molded stuff myself, but you can just go on like the Polar Studio website, whatever parts you want just order them and have them shipped direct to me. Cut out the middleman entirely, you'll save on shipping. Um, and then I can just, yeah, straight up install whatever it is that you want. I'm happy to do heaps of different custom options, whatever it is that you want. Um, the truth is that most of my clients just prefer to keep things original. So the leather that I generally stock is gonna be black, tan and dark brown, so the three original SX-70 colors. But if you want me to do something crazy, if you want me to do pink or orange or something like that, just let me know and we'll sort something out. Now I'm just gonna loosen these two screws because sometimes they press on the rear of the housing and make it a little difficult to get off. And yep, there we go, that's one side. And what I like to do, if I can, Ow. Don't slip. Luckily this screwdriver is fairly blunt. There we go. There we go. Yeah, no harm done. Didn't break the skin. Um, what I like to do is just get rid of it like so. The rear housing can be very difficult to take off a sonar camera. And it's not stuck on the flash socket. It's just, it's just straight up stuck. There we go. Ta-da! That's the easiest way I find to remove them. And I will, I think what I'll do, I'll put this bit back, I'll put the transducer back, and I'll put the little clip that holds the transducer in place. Actually, I will give this a clean first because the transducer is very dusty around the edge. Might as well give it a dust while I've got it loose because it's going to be much easier to access. And... There we go. All right. So everything is looking really clean. The lens has a little spot of haze in it. I'm hoping that that's not, uh, it might be in the bit that I can't access. Hmm. If it is, I won't be able to, I won't be able to show my repair technique because I'm currently out of stock of the cement that I use to put them back together. Um, but what I what I will have to do, if that, there's like a little bit of fungus and haze, and the only way to, the only way to access that rear triplet is to cut out the glass and then re-cement it back into the plastic. Uh, it's very annoying. I'm gonna take off the LD wheel as well. Easy. Oh my goodness, there we go. Oh yeah. uh, because I'll be removing that little circuit board. I'll probably take off the walking arm and I can take off that uh, wheel as well. Now what I was doing with the pencil, I was marking where the focusing wheel lines up with the idler gear there. And that's just gonna help me put it on correctly. Why am I getting like 6,000 messages today? I'm very popular. Now, hopefully, 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 the bit I need to clean is... Uh, it is not. 
It is not. I need to get into the rear triplet. Bow bow. How irritating. Oh, I'll message Jeremy and I'll let him know because I'm going to have to cut into that and I'm going to need to order some more optical cement, which means... Because I do want to show that process. Um, I have some. I could not tell you where it is. I lost it in the move. I thought that it was sitting in my spare parts. Turns out it wasn't. <laughs> I don't know where any of that stuff is. I thought I had it like in amongst my lens cells in my spare parts drawers, but clearly I put it somewhere else. It's not expensive, it's only about $13 or so, but it's just annoying. It's just irritating that I don't know where it is. Anyway, I am just going to trim these legs off of that little helper. Get my scalpel here, cut these lugs, and lift this panel off. This panel is superfluous when you install the uh, SX70R PCB. It's no longer necessary, so just adds bulk, adds weight, makes the shutter harder to clean. So we will get rid of it. And then I can continue taking apart this shutter. But yeah, I probably, what I'll probably do, I'll take off the PCB. Um, and I won't do anything else until I have my optical cement, which hopefully will only take a week or so. And then I'll finish the video once all my bits and pieces are here. And this might even become a two-part series if it gets really, really long. Because I'm doing quite a lot to this camera, to be honest. Alright. Now this PCB is in good condition, so I'll save that in my ever-growing pile of spare parts. And these solenoid legs are welded on really well. This soldered on super well. What I'm just doing here is just removing all the various bits and pieces that connect to the PCB so that I can lift the, the old PCB off and then have it ready to accept the new one. So I desoldered the ribbon cable there. Now I'm going to desolder the second solenoid. And then the three connections to the shutter button. There we go. Next connection to the shutter button. I use a scalpel for this, by the way, because it, it just lets me slide under the little legs a little easier. But you could really use anything. You could use a screwdriver, whatever. Doesn't really matter as long as you can lift the little legs. Just try not to cut any traces, obviously. And of course, we will need to recycle the ribbon cable as well. Ta-da! All right, so we have one shutter housing basically prepped to accept the new PCB, but I need to clean the rear of that lens cell. Now, if it was just little bits of dust, I wouldn't bother but given that this is actually haze and like what appears to be some spots of fungus, um, I will give it a good clean. While I'm here and I've got everything out, I'm just gonna flush the solenoid. 
I mean, it's moving so nicely anyway, but just to make sure. This one is completely and utterly in spec, I can tell. All right. So we've got our, uh, our old PCB. I'm just gonna put that in my pile of spares. And yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably leave that glass intact for now. Um, but one thing that I will show you guys is what to do with the shutter housing, because I need to make two modifications on this. The first is purely cosmetic, and then the second is for the SX70R PCB. So I'll just grab the new shutter button, which hopefully works okay. I've never used any of Polar Studio's reproduction buttons before. So there are three little metal tabs on the rear of the little chrome bezel that goes over the original shutter button. Uh, I'll just give this brass a little bit of a clean with some contact cleaner. Because it had gone a little green under there. So I just want to make sure that this little switch here is in good nick. Very good. And we'll put the green button over. And then this is always a little fiddly to get back together. But you basically just have to make sure all the bits line up. And that was actually, that was actually way easier than I thought it was going to be. Uh, and then you fold the little legs back over again. Come on. Come on, you were in there before. I think I lost it. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. Two. And get that third little leg on. Sorry if my hair's getting in the, in the way. This is pretty fiddly. There we go. Um, I really like the green. That looks really cool, don't you think? Now the other thing that we need to do is get rid of this little tinted window. There's a tinted window that goes over the electric eye. The SX70R PCB is designed to be used with a clear window, and they actually supply that when you purchase the boards. Um, so Yongmin's given me heaps of different clear boards as spare parts. However, um, the tinted window is actually necessary for the 680. And the reason being is that the SLR 680, the little, uh, the little hole underneath the electric eye there, because there's the shutter blades have two openings, one for the lens, one for the electric eye. On the 680, they're actually a wider opening and that actually means you do need the tinted window, but only for the 680. Uh, anyway, there's not much that I can do. I'll get the clear window out and do that as one of the final things, but for now I'll just leave that window completely blank. I'm gonna go message my client and, uh, and let him know what I've been up to and what I need to do next. And we'll see if he wants that lens cleaned. Well, I ended up fixing the lens by actually just getting another, uh, uh, another shutter, shutter housing that would suit a, suit a sonar camera. Um, I actually happened to have one spare from an SLR 680 of all cameras. Uh, I ended up taking out the original 680 blades, replacing the arm, I took the solenoid out, we swapped the whole bunch of parts over, because simply at the moment it is going to be a lot quicker for me to do that than have to wait for bits and pieces to arrive. Uh, I did toy with the idea of putting in a metal lens cell from a Model 2, but ultimately I've decided, do you know what, best to just keep it as original as possible. So I've used the lens cell from a 680, the front cell from the sonar, uh, and what I'll need to do once it's all calibrated is just refix down the infinity label at the correct distance. But I have uh, installed the PCB. The only thing that is left to do now is basically just solder down the ribbon cable. And then pretty much 
reassemble the camera once that silicon has dried. And that's really all that will be left to do. Uh, I'll clean the viewfinder off camera because I've done it enough times on this channel already. But yeah, when it comes to the plastic lens cells, the only options you have is either start cutting them up or simply replace them. Um, I will show you guys how to cut one up in a future video. As I said, I just, I do not know where my optical cement has gone and I'm going to need to order some more and that'll take a week or so to arrive in stock. And I would much rather get this camera off my bench and Jeremy was happy with whatever solution worked and, <laughs> and I quote, wasn't a pain. And I said, well, all the solutions are a pain, um, but this one was probably the least painful way that I could do it. So that's what I ended up with. Um, but yeah, I might, um, I might actually just install that lens cell in this camera. Uh, in this shutter housing a little later on. I haven't decided yet, but yeah, that's pretty much what we're looking at at the moment. And uh, yeah, it basically just needs things like the focusing wheel and stuff all reattached. So I am going to box this thing up back together and uh, show you guys the finished shutter. All right, guys, we are back. I have completely reassembled the main shutter. So we've got the new PCB installed. We have the new lens installed. All the light dark wheel is on. I've lined up the focusing wheel. All the autofocus mechanism is intact. I still need to put one screw on this side, but I'm gonna leave that off because I will for sure have to recalibrate that lens. And now it is time for disassembly. I've put on the replacement Fresnel screen, which we got from the uh, SX-70 Model 1. Uh, so that is gonna give this sonar camera a split prism assembly. And I'm just gonna brush a few light little bits of dust off that have landed just on the screen, just before I add the rule of thirds grid. Now, funnily enough, when I was in the SX-70 Facebook forum this morning, a guy was complaining about how he found uh, it very hard to align his horizons when shooting his SX-70. And his comment was like, oh, you know, one of the technicians out there should really figure out a solution for this. To which I just went, <clears throat> um, I've been doing this for years now. <laughs> At least just offering it to clients because it is the simplest way to add a grid to an SX-70 camera. Um, someone suggested that you can use the split prism as a, a reference point, um, which is sort of true. But one of the things you actually have to consider is a lot of times these Fresnel screens, they actually weren't glued on particularly straight from the factory and can be wonky. And a lot of them that I see are off by like a millimeter on either side. This one is dead straight. But when I add the lines, I typically use the side, like for the horizontal lines, I use the, um, the gear train as a reference and I butt the ruler straight up to it um, to make it as accurate as possible. That way, even if the screen is wonky, uh, it will still work. And it's the same for the vertical lines, I actually butt them up against the hinges so that even if the Fresnel is not installed correctly, which just did happen back in the factory, they weren't always glued on 100% straight. Um, but yeah, it just means that the lines are going to be accurate. Uh, but yes, it is certainly possible if you would like help with the horizon then my technique of using a ruler and just simply a pencil to add lines works really well. Uh, and it's certainly the easiest technique that I've found, but yeah, it adds a very nice grid, which really aids with composition, especially given that that split prism is in the lower third. 
because of Dr. Edwin Land's insistence that the split prism would somehow detract from the picture taking experience and the compromise with the engineers. Uh, but I digress. Um, I really like it. It's a, it's a really cool option. Um, and I offer it for free because I mean, I'm inside the camera anyway, and it's nothing fancy. I'm literally just taking a pencil and adding a grid. Um, so, you know, what more do you want? But it's, it's a really handy little trick. And I believe I was the first person to figure out that you could do that. So there you go. Happy to share my innovation around. All right, so let's collapse this down, start putting the bellows back together, and then we can start to assemble the new Polaroid back, um, which I believe does come with some new screws uh, to replace the originals. Uh, I, I haven't even looked to see what kind of head they use. I assume they're just a Phillips head, but that's kind of neat that they give the user new screws. Of course, you could just recycle the old ones. Uh, there we go. I'm looking for the right size screw here, just to put the bellows back in place. Easy, there we go. Uh, I also cleaned the viewfinder off camera. Um, I think from now on I'm just gonna clean the viewfinders off camera because they're a little fiddly. Sometimes they can take me a few minutes to get back together and I, you know, once you've cleaned one, you've kind of cleaned them all uh, by this point. Now, one thing I do need to find is just where I've put the hinge pins for the viewfinder here. Here's the ones from the front. And I just need the ones from the side, which I've put here. And where's the small one? Here we go. There we are. All right. So let's put these hinge pins back in place. If you're replacing hinge pins, by the way, on a uh, on a, an SLR camera, be aware that the knurled aspect of the hinge pins goes on the outer side. Uh, it doesn't go facing the inside. If you do that, that is a recipe for disaster. Um, you'll have a very hard time getting them out ever again. So just FYI, something to be aware of. The knurled side is, uh, yeah, it's supposed to face the outside of the body. You do not put it in first. <laughs> or you will make getting it out again very difficult. Uh, I know because I've seen it happen so many times people bust out the hinges and then they hammer it in or something using the um, the knurled side for, uh, first and it's it gets very difficult. Um, right, what am I doing now? Um, I've done the motor. Um, I've done, yeah, basically everything. I just pretty much have to put the shutter in at this point. And then we can focus on putting the housing on. I've done the viewfinder. The lens is clean. I'll just make sure we clean the rear of the lens. But yeah, that's looking spotless, no dust or anything. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, and again, I'll just hold it in place with two screws for now until I want to box everything up. And we'll solder on the side ribbon cable. And then yeah, I think just focus on putting that nice new bottom housing on. I'm just gonna stick the air conditioner on because it's quite hot here in Western Australia. And the room is slowly heating up with the morning sun. So if you ever if you ever hear background noise, that's what it is. It's just the air conditioner running in the background. All right, uh, let's do this with a bit of flux. Do, 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 do. 
soldering iron is nice and hot. And uh, yeah, since this is the first time I'll be assembling one of these Polar Studio adapters, um, this will be an interesting learning experience for both of us. Although, I don't really think there's anything to it. I think you really just swap the panel and you call it a day. Great. Now I'll get rid of the flux residue. That's better. All right. I'm just going to remove a little bit of solder on the third pin end since I think I put a little too much. Much nicer. Okay. Yeah, you don't want the so you do want the solder on these pins to be nice and thick, but you don't want it to be ridiculously thick. Um, last thing I'll do is just put a bit of capped-on tape uh, over the ribbon cable. As I've said before, this helps in terms of insulation, but more importantly, it just helps keep the ribbon cable kind of stuck flat. Um, where are my scissors? Here they are. Um, yeah, it helps keep the ribbon cable stuck flat down because it has a tendency to kind of get peeled up when you install the bottom panel. There we go. Well, it's not the neatest cut, is it? I, um, I've got to either clean or adjust these scissors. They've stopped cutting cleanly and I don't know why. There we go. Yeah, just enough to keep it folded down. Now, the main attraction. I'm going to leave the screws there for now, but this should just be a matter of installing this uh, just on the bottom, and it should just straight up work. Kind of like... So, how nice does that look? All right, I'll put the uh, front housing on like so, and then we'll give it a little bit of a test. And then I'm gonna need to go and charge my camera because it's on low battery for some reason. I swear it was charging. But let's see if I've got enough juice in the camera to, there we go, green lights have turned on. Oh, <laughs> so powerful. Wow. Well, it certainly has the oomph. I don't think I've ever felt. <laughs> that is ridiculous. <laughs> All right, Johnny, please install a battery door on this so that this can become my number one recommendation. Wow, is that powerful. Holy moly. Well, there you go. Okay, I'm gonna come back and uh, just after I charge my camera for a little bit, good timing because the neighbors have started their inevitable Friday morning yard work. And uh, I'll be back um, after I've put the housing on and I guess finished boxing this thing up. 
Well, folks, there you have it. Um, I think I say this every single time I do a refurb, but this may be one of my nicest refurbishments yet, just in terms of what an insanely capable camera this thing is. Um, I have tested this with film. It works absolutely great. And uh, in case you couldn't tell from my very surprised tone, um, I'm astonished at just how well the Polar Studio uh, battery back performs. I mean, <laughs> it's just crazy. Um, it really sounds like I've sped up the video footage. I, I don't think I've ever uh, had an SX-70 camera that performs as fast as this thing does now. So here it is fully assembled. The only thing that I haven't done is add the bottom leather panel to the camera and that's because I've been chatting with my client Jeremy who, by the way, cut and supplied this leather himself. He actually went to a tanner, got some leather and then laser cut the pieces before sticking them to adhesive absolutely insane. I've never seen a client of mine do a DIY job as good as this. Um, but I haven't stuck the bottom leather panel on because I've been chatting to Jeremy about the battery issue with this. And I said, look, if you skin this camera, you're going to have to de-skin it in a few years when that battery runs out of charge. So what he's actually decided to do is the same technique that I did on my uh, OpenSX70 camera. And that will be when I, I ship this to him, I'm just gonna leave this skin separate. He's very likely gonna remove these two screws and in the leather panel with the laser cutter or a leather punch, he will remove the two screws that are here, uh, basically make corresponding holes in the leather so that he can access those two Phillips head screws and that's gonna hold the camera together really nicely. Um, the shape of the body panel at the rear means that these two rear screws aren't strictly necessary. You can kind of get away without using them. So holding it on with just these two is gonna do a fine job uh, because of the shape of the lip there and how it holds to the camera. And I think that would be sort of the, the best combination of aesthetics and practicality because it would be a real shame to have to remove this leather after Jeremy's put so much time and effort into it. So I'm not going to cut those holes myself. Uh, I theoretically could, but Jeremy already possesses the laser cutter and that kind of stuff. So he's going to do that himself. And in the meantime, the camera doesn't look too bad with the bottom panel. It is, of course, embossed with the Polar Studio logo. Um, but I must say, I'm super impressed with this thing as a product. Um, if you hold down the button, a light comes on inside the film counter. You guys probably can't see it because of my bright studio lights here. Um, so you can see what shots you're on at nighttime. Uh, one press of the button turns it on and two fast presses turns it off. So the camera uh, is effectively shut down. Now, I had a chat to Johnny who runs Polar Studio and he said that he did invent another version of this which was slightly longer that had a battery that you could remove. Um, I would prefer it to be, you know, three mils longer than have to be something that you replace. I mean, it's this old argument of, you know, oh, but we made the built-in battery to save size. I mean, look at this thing. It's already a big camera. <laughs> Like, we're not talking about little point and shoots that are supposed to fit in your pocket. Maybe if you have a giant trench coat, you can fit this in your pocket. It's a damn Polaroid for crying out loud. What does it matter if it's literally this much longer and it gives you a door to add that extra functionality? I mean, it's, it sounds like it, it's just such a completely ridiculous argument um, to not have something that's, uh, you know, more user friendly. I mean, who cares? Have you seen how long this thing is? Let's let's pull out a, me a, a, a ruler and let's just measure how long this SX-70 is. It is nine and a half inches for the Americans watching or uh, around 24 centimeters long. What does it matter if it's 25 centimeters long? Who really cares? What is that extra centimeter doing that is gonna get in your way that much? I mean, have you seen the size of this thing already? It would be like, I don't even know what this would be like. It would be like, it would be like, you know, a, a giant Ford F-150 pickup truck and you go, oh no, we can't make it 10 centimeters longer. Yes, you can. Like, you've already made it huge. What's the difference? What's a couple of mil? Anyway, I digress. 
Um, this is, in terms of usability, one of the nicest SX-70s I've ever made. Um, Jeremy already possesses the dongle at home, but for those that are watching here, the dongle that I would be pairing with this camera would be also something in like the matching silver, uh, which I made up. And that would basically give you all the all the settings on the back because this has been modified to the SX-70 RPCB. So we could just turn it on. Oh, of course, it's gonna say uh, failed to connect because the battery back wasn't turned on. So let's try that again. It should work now. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there we go. You have to hold it in for a second uh, to turn it on. So now it should scan, now it should pick up the fact that uh, the SX-70 RPCB is there. And of course, we've got all of those delicious manual settings. So let's just do a nice long one second exposure. Um, of course, the dongle has all the uh, studio strobes and that kind of stuff if, you, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, just a really awesome camera. I-type functionality, manual control, built-in self-timer, built-in battery with super high performance. And not to mention, it just looks really nice. I really like the smoked uh, plastic housing that Jeremy sent over. I did actually sign and put my initials and things inside the uh, sonar housing so that Jeremy can see that um, at any time. And uh, yeah, it's just turned out really, really nice. I mean, you can use a flash with it. I think between the two cameras that Jeremy has commissioned me to make for him, I don't think I've ever had custom jobs done just so tastefully. <laughs> I mean, the guy really has a sense of style. Look at these. I mean, what a pair of cameras, right? The only thing that I wish is that I could just, for the sake of a photo, just put that leather panel on, because man, it would look so nice when finished. Anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed the build process of Jeremy's camera. Um, I also took the liberty of putting a solenoid adjustment hole on the side of his shutter as well. Uh, I've also done the same with his 680. Uh, basically what that means is should the shutter ever fall out of tune in the future, because it does need to be rather highly calibrated in terms of the SX-70 RPCB, um, it's very easy to tweak that solenoid now. Um, there's basically a little two millimeter hole that you can stick the screwdriver in and loosen or tighten the solenoid uh, to change the speed of the blades at your will. And uh, yeah, I, I really can't wait for Jeremy to get his hands back on these cameras. I mean, these are just such amazing machines. And uh, Jeremy, it's been a pleasure doing business with you. You've been such an awesome client to deal with. Um, I look forward to making many more cameras for you in the future, I'm sure. But yeah, that's really all I wanted to cover today. I basically wanted to show off just uh, a ground up rebuild and something a little more custom um, because on this channel so far, I've really shown a lot of like original restorations. I haven't gone balls to the wall crazy. And I think between custom shutter button, the housing, the Polar Studio adapter, we've really been able to go all out. Um, and on the subject of custom parts, the ma majority of these parts other than the leather were made by Polar Studio, which is a company based out of, I believe it's Hong Kong. And they make all kinds of injection molded plastic parts and custom colored shutter buttons and that, that type of thing. If you ever want anything special fitted to your camera that I otherwise don't keep in stock, please feel free to just simply purchase these and have them shipped directly to me, cut out the middleman. Uh, as Jeremy did. He's, he had the package sent direct to me. I've been able to just simply install everything. It was a very easy process and I think the results look absolutely amazing. So Jeremy, enjoy your PC synchronized 680. Enjoy your utterly fantastic SX-70 Sona. And uh, for all those watching, uh, happy shooting. I'll see you in the next video. As always, if you like the channel, you like what I do, support me in all the links down below. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, you know the drill. Um, happy shooting and have a wonderful rest of your day.